and welcome to this, the second of our uh, webinar series on work-based assessment. I'm delighted uh, to be with you this morning. We've got a lot of people. I think we've got about 175 registered. Um, so, I'm, I'm, so obviously the topic is really, really important. Um, as you know, when we started uh, this series um, in partnership with, with our colleagues from, from QQI, um, our aim was to try and get a national conversation going around work-based assessment. And in particular, to look at the challenges and the opportunities and the critical issues for staff and students and to work towards, I think, um, a national understanding and a learning community so that we can actually um, work together to find some shared solutions to common problems. Now, just before I, I, I talk about the, the series as a whole and I hand over to, to um, our presenters for today, um, I'd just like to tell you that please use the chat uh, for any questions you have as we, we, we go throughout. Um, as we have lots of people, it'll be quite difficult to pull people individually in using the, the videos and their voice. Um, and that the, the is, is actually being recorded so the recording of the webinar, uh, the slides, and the results of any of the activities, which you, there's many that you have to do in the next hour, all of those will be made available to you after the, um, after the webinar today. So we started with the first webinar, uh, which was um, shared challenges and opportunities. Today, we're exploring the challenge of consistency. And just to remind you on November the 19th, we have a, a much longer discussion, uh, a symposium, getting to grips with policies and practice. And I'll talk a little bit more about the symposium and the plans for that at the end of the session. But why do we have exploring the challenge of consistency as the title of our webinar today? And the reason was that when we asked you in the first webinar, what one of the biggest challenges was, you said consistency. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Associate Prefer Professor Derling O'Neill uh, from UCD, um, who's going to uh, lead this particular webinar. Um, and I'm delighted to say that Geraldine is also one of Ireland's inaugural teaching and learning fellows, and her work or her fellowship is based in this area. Geraldine, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Terry. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to speak to you here today. Um, as Terry said, my, my research is going to be in this area, but I've also been involved in, in work-based assessment for a long time in my career. I uh, was an occupational therapist many years back, so, so I, have, I have some experience over the years with work-based assessment. But I wanted to start today with the results of the first webinar that we had. Um, in that webinar, we actually said to people, what were the challenges that you have? Um, what opportunities could there be? And what do you want further discussion on? And what you came back were consistency and standards was one of the key issues that you really struggled with. Um, grading approaches was also linked with that. So this gray in the middle here is the, um, is the challenges that you talked about. Authenticity and relevancy was also an issue and student engagement and feedback. So they were the key assessment challenges. Um, outside of that uh, circle in the middle are non-assessment related things that link with assessment. Um, but we have followed your wishes, as Terry said, to actually do some more on consistency. So the full data of that is available from the National Forum if you want to see it. So consistency is what we wanted to do today and, and to explore a bit today. So today specifically, we want to look at what is meant by the term consistency, uh, what might be the causes of inconsistency, particularly across different contexts. We want to explore the students' experience of consistency, and we want to look at how the sector might address the area of consistency going forward. Just some initial thoughts. So what do we mean by consistency? The term is often linked um, with the term reliability, um, and it means it's often associated with consistency of outcomes or consistency of scores. 
So one of the definitions of it is that consistency in assessment involves the achievement of comparable outcomes. Um, for example, an assessment process would be considered to deliver consistent outcomes if assessors assessing candidates against the same unit of competencies in different contexts made comparable assessment decisions. I know that might be hard for the interpreter to, to, uh, to, to get all those uh, concepts, but uh, because I know we have an interpreter here today. So, but basically consistency is around um, scores, grades, and how kind of reliable they are over time and over, over different um, raters. QQI themselves very nicely put it as the same result under similar conditions. So the same result under similar conditions. So there's a few different types of consistency across many different types of assessment. Um, and some of these are particularly more challenging maybe in a work-based learning context. But the first one is consistent over time, often called test retest. The next one is consistency between assessors. Um, and this is the one in the literature that is often described as challenging in um, work-based learning contexts. The next one, consistent across contexts, so across different placement types, another challenging area in work-based learning, and then consistency across the assessment tasks themselves. So these three authors, Miller, Downing and Brennan, have talked a lot and many of the literature talks about the different types of consistency. So the first thought activity we thought we would do is to ask you what aspects of consistency are challenged specifically for you. And the way we wanted to look at this was ask you to go to mentimeter.com. So I would suggest to do this task, you might use your phone if you have it beside you and type in mentimeter.com or open another tab here and go to mentimeter.com and use the code 565131. So that's 565131. So we'll give you a few minutes to, to do that task, um, but want you to answer the question, what aspects of consistency are a challenge for you? And as I mentioned, there was many different types test, retest, cross contexts, cross tasks. So I'll give you a few minutes to, to do that. So 565131 www.menti.com. So Colin, could I ask you to even start sharing that? Is it Okay, great. <clears throat> so let's have a little look. So um, developing reliable, well-trained assessors at the workplace. So at the assessors at the workplace. So work placement assessors, yeah. Consistency without homogenization, great word, yes. Interrater is one that people are particularly worried about. As the assessors themselves, yes. Across contexts and across assessors, yeah. Across assessors. Interpretation of grades, what's a distinction? Yeah. Getting history across faculty, across context. So, context is coming up a lot. Lecture materials between assessors, across context, cross respect tasks. That's the first time that one came up. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Different types of placements across different companies for a program. Yeah. So, again, across context. Yeah, so these two are coming up very strongly across grades, agreement between raters, subjectivity, it's probably the person involved in it, yeah, assessors between staff, yeah, so, so really some nice um, results there consisting between assessors. So it's the assessors one that's coming up a lot, actually. Um, 
Great. So, so course outline and lessons plan. Yeah, so that's maybe the task itself. Host feedback. So, and what's coming through a lot, and it's come through in the literature a lot as well, is the workplace assessors. Yes. One of the challenges is that the assessors, so the practitioners, I know people have different language on this, practitioners, employers, work placement staff, trying to get consistency with work placement staff in the assessment. Okay, I, I think it gives us a flavor uh, very much. So you can stop sharing that, Colin, that would be great. And people can still keep adding because we will share this back with you afterwards. Um, and some of the influences on consistency. Well, first of all, there is the work context. One of the challenges um, is that unlike in, in the institutions or on campus, the work context vary hugely um, from very sort of supported or very unsupported contexts, very different kind of um, placement types. And these make assessment really challenging as some of you have already alluded to. There's the unique student. Students are unique. So they, um, they don't, um, they, they come with their own set of skills, knowledge, capacities. So they're not at the same starting point. The assessor, their values, their knowledge, their skills. The standards in which we are measuring against are really key in relation to um, trying to get things more consistent. And the clarity of these standards is really important. The level of staff training on assessment, many of you have alluded to that, that the assessor is the, is the assessor and the context are two key challenges for you. The number of assessors, um, Roberts and, and Moon and Van Loon have talked about the more assessors, the more reliable. Um, and many of the times it is the one assessor in workplace learning. And then you have the range of, of encounters or tasks. Um, the, and then some of you mentioned the task as actually being a challenge on assessment consistency. I just, Colin, could you progress that for me? It's not progressing. Sorry, okay, working now. Um, this one is one that is mentioned a lot in the literature. That is having a shared understanding of the standards required. And these are statements of what you want students to do. Um, and having a shared understanding of these is really important. And we need to work, as, as Herbert et al would say, in communities of practice to try and achieve a, a strong understanding of the standards required. And I know some of our speakers are going to, to talk to that. So some of the challenges of inconsistency, I, I'd like to think of it a little bit like shifting sands when I was thinking about this. Uh, work placements and work is never the same. The context is changing, the people are changing, the students are different. Um, Common in the middle maybe are standards and, and how you grade, um, but even in them, they, they, they are, they, they're as fairly sta static and steady, but they, they can have different challenges with them. Um, and then there's the task and the tool and the staff involved. So, so many of these are changing, which makes the challenge of consistency quite difficult. So what we thought we would do is look a little bit at consistency in relation to the context, starting with the context. And one of the ways I'm looking at this in relation to my own um, fellowship research is the context based on who is actually assessing. In work-based assessment, we have three key assessors, three key partners. In the middle is the student who should be very much part of assessing and, and knowing and judging their own work. You have the higher or further education staff um, who are in campus on, in, in the institutions. And then on the right, you have the workplace staff who many of you call clinicians, practitioners, mentors, preceptors, many different names for those staff. But if you look at these in relation to context, 
very busy slide, I know, but I'll try and talk you through it. Um, there are three broad contexts in relation to who assesses. On the left here, you've got context A, which is on campus. Um, and the wider definition of work integrated learning includes this context. And these are modules that are primarily based on campus, but are very connected with work. So they might be case-based learning, projects, um, authentic projects, projects with industry partners, clinics, field trips. But the assessor is primary, the higher or further education institutional staff, the educator as we call them. In the middle, you've got on placement, so they're out on placement, but the primary assessor might is still possibly the educator. So they might do something on placement and they come back and they may write a reflective journal, a project, and present something, but it's assessed primarily by the higher education staff, or sorry, or further, Siobhan, <laughs> to, to include the, the further education staff. Forgive me in my background as higher education. <laughs> um, and then on the, the right, you have sort of um, placement staff who are clinicians or employers who are the prime assessors. So if you look at that, there are different contexts. And then if you look up the vertical um, axis, you have students' involvement in this process. So are the students very involved in the assessment? Do they have any control of what they're assessed on or how they're assessed? So I have just myself, from my own experience, placed what I think, this is my view, uh, on like sometimes internships and co-ops are often in, in this context B, whereas sometimes clinical placements, apprenticeships, but I, I would be, I, I will let you decide that, are, are in, in context C. So what I thought we would do, we're going to get you discussing your consistency challenges, thinking of these contexts. So the first activity we wanted you to do in this um, is to ask you, where would you position your work integrated learning placement or modules based on context and who assesses? So where would you position? So we want to ask you to um, go to the, we're gonna get you to position on that matrix, which you'll see in a minute, but the way you do it is go to the top to see view options. If you go up to view options at the top of your screen, go to annotate and choose a stamp and then a star. Okay, so choose a stamp and then a star on the whiteboard that we are, are, are going to share with you, with you now. So view options, annotate and choose a stamp and then choose a star. Um, if you have more than one type of placement, you can also use a cross. So you, so you may have, for example, where we have internships, but you know, I'm also involved in project modules in, in my institution. So I'm going to do this. So maybe uh, you would share that whiteboard um, column. And if people can start to place themselves on it, and let's see, a nice little heart there, lovely. And we'll get a feel for people in the room. So remembering the vertical axis is whether students are strongly involved and the bottom horizontal axis is where the practitioner is summatively primarily involved. Okay, so we're getting a nice little spatter across, yeah. Interesting here, there is practitioners very involved, but maybe the students not quite as involved. Yeah, great. If you have any trouble with using this, you can add to the chat. So if anybody does have trouble technically doing this or finds it too difficult to do, just write in the chat, I'm in context B with some student involvement or context C. So nice to see some people have the on-campus stuff as well with strong student involvement, yeah. Many of you in that top right hand um, quadrant actually. And one of the challenges with that is it has a particular type of consistency challenges because again, you have more work placement, more practitioners involved. And um, sometimes it can be a little 
less challenging in, 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 in context B, but we'll explore that a little bit further. Okay, so what we'll ask you to do now is we're gonna get you into breakout groups for 10 minutes. And we want you to have a little discussion. Uh, first of all, we want you to highlight your context. So if some of you have already, you've already started to do that, well, I'm on campus or actually I'm on placement, I'm, with, I'm, I'm in that um, context B in the institution or I'm in context C. And I want you to, we want you to discuss for 10 minutes the causes of inconsistency in your context, teasing out you know, well, is it getting a sense, is it different in these different contexts? And maybe one person would just summarize in the chat afterwards. So you might just nominate somebody to do that. So we'll share this slide with you in the breakout group as well. Colin is going to do that too. So we're going to get you now into breakout groups. So give us a minute or two for, for us to do that. There should be four of you in the, in the breakout groups and um, we'll give you 10 minutes and we'll give you a, we will give you a countdown. So you 10 minutes to actually um, to look at the, this question. What are the causes of inconsistency in your context? Okay, if people are starting to come back in, uh, we might be starting to come get people back in. Maybe just to remind you that maybe one person would summarize in the chat, just even one or two points that came up. Um, so we'll have that and again, be able to share it back with you because it would be really interesting to get a feel for if consistency is different across these contexts. So if one of the people would um, do that, that would be great. Um, and we, we look at that as, it'll probably take you a few minutes to do that. So we, we'll come back and look at that um, maybe towards the end. Um, can I hand back over now to Terry? Is, are we, have we most people back in the room? Colin, do you think I can go with that? Everyone's back in the room, yeah. Everyone's back in the room, great, okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, and thank you for putting, yeah, I see somebody starting to put things up. The main discussion was about governance, who makes the decision about a trainee, the local colleagues, an external um, academic consultant, okay. Um, and thank you for that, Manuel. Um, that is a, a, a very useful thing because that is the challenge between the three different types of assessors. And one of the, Things in the literature that comes through is that it's really a balance of, of those three assessors trying to see who gets you know has the most weighting between the the local colleague or the um the internal kind of um, institutional colleague it's very much a tri-person tripartite um uh, solution to it um another one coming back the three of us in the group seemed fairly new to work-based learnings so we're here just to listen. We had a general chat, that's okay. <laughs> Did not tickle cockets, that's all right, okay, no problem. Um, local interpretations of standards to be achieved need more for training. So training, so local interpretations, that goes back, thank you for that, Finola. Uh, that goes back to um, understanding of the standards. Um, in Siobhan's group herself, um, this is achievable employers are time poor, instruments can be poor also. Yes, yes, so a real challenge of time poor. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna move on because we have some um, keynote speakers to introduce to you. So Terry, can I pass to you to introduce our speakers? Pass over to you and we'll have a look back at the chat afterwards. Thanks. Absolutely, and, and welcome back everybody. Um, last time when we had our, our, our first webinar, I had my evil, my evil, very evil uh, uh, horn. Today, Jers persuaded me not to use the, the, the horn for our speakers today, but to actually use um, a much gentler noise from her phone. So we're delighted to be able now to invite two of our speakers who are going to speak to you just for five minutes um, about some of the work that they're doing within their own context, their research and their practice. So it gives me great practice a pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Anne O'Connor from the University of Limerick. And Anne is going to speak about strategies and solutions to inconsistency in performance-based assessment. Thank you, Anne. Great, thanks, Terry. Um, I think, Colin, I don't have control yet of the, the screen there. Um, but again, no, I'm not moving them. Yeah, you should, if you are in there now and just try. Nothing. 
Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if I can move it. Okay. I'm not moving it, Colin, but I can get started and I can tell you when to move it forward for me. Perfect. Okay. So, hi, everyone. Um, my name is um, Anne O'Connor. I am currently um, working in the University of Limerick and um, just completed my PhD this last year on work-based assessment in um, physiotherapy practice education. So in other words, um, clinical placements that our students go on um, and the assessment process that occurs out there in the workplace, which essentially um, determines their readiness for independent practice as a clinician. So um, this morning, I'm going to talk to you really just about the students' perceptions of that process. So the whole, um, PhD research was around looking at a stakeholder centered approach to determining the challenges and facilitators of work based assessment in the physiotherapy context. So we had three stakeholder groups in total. It was a national study. So it um, invited all of the schools of physio across the country um, within the Republic of Ireland to, um, to engage with this study. So we had students, we had practice educators. So in other words, they're the clinicians who basically work in the workplace as clinicians, but also voluntarily um, supervise physiotherapy students um, during their programs. And then we also have what's known as practice tutors who are essentially qualified clinicians, but who are dedicated educational roles in the workplace and who were implemented around the start of mid 2000s um, to essentially support the students and the clinicians who supervise the students on um, clinical placement. So it's quite a specialized role. It's quite um, unique to healthcare, um, but it has certainly um, helped in terms of um, improving work-based assessment. So like I said, you can move, oh yeah. Okay, so the student um, findings then um, really like were kind of encompassed within two themes. So the first one was this whole aspect of looking at the inconsistencies that they perceived in the process and the impact of those inconsistencies. And then the second one was around say strategies and solutions in order to improve that process. So students overall felt that there was a clear lack of standardization of grading across the sites. Now our other stakeholders felt the same, so it wasn't an, a, 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 an unusual finding. They felt that variable grades could be awarded depending on say geographical location or depending on say the area of specialty that the students um, were involved in. They felt that there was say a variation in terms of the assessors. Some could be very hard markers, some could be very easy markers. Um, and also they perceived quite a lack of knowledge, again, between some sites who never took students, some sites who took them all the time. So they felt that there was a clear lack of knowledge among some sites in terms of filling out the forms, what learning outcomes meant, what they were expected to achieve. The impact of that clearly was that they felt that there was a lack of transparency across the process. And as a result, they felt that they lacked or, or that they, they didn't believe in the process and they didn't believe in the fairness of the process. So clearly those findings are quite significant in terms of moving forward. I'll move on again there, yeah. Okay, so as a result, they developed these strategies and the strategies then were, um, I suppose, ways that they felt they could beat the system in other words. So they felt that if you developed a good relationship with your educator, you were unlikely to get a low grade. They also believed that if there was any choice of, say, clinical sites that they could go to, that they might actually pursue the one that was the easier mark, marker and forego the benefit of learning. So again, these are quite concerning little strategies that they had built up. And the other one that was quite concerning was they felt that if they just copied the practice of the supervising therapists rather than thinking independently, which would be our, say, educational ethos, that they would actually just get better results because if they just copied the supervisor, well, then they were working towards what they worked um, towards. So the solutions then um, were that they obviously looked for more transparency in the system. They actually were looking for a mandatory training of the educators who were involved in the assessment process. And they wanted more observation of students on placement so that regardless of whether you, do, you were doing well or whether you were doing poorly, the educator could con continue to see developing performance. So finally, um, just I suppose a commentary on all that, clearly their solutions are relevant and um, certainly we saw similar um, things being brought up with the other stakeholder groups. But what we really saw was this failure to see their own role in terms of their own development of learning in the work-based um, process. 
There were similar views from other stakeholders regarding the inconsistencies. And generally, there was, a, a, I suppose, a sense that we need to encourage ownership of learning among students through, say, self-assessment, peer assessment. We also need to look at the number of assessments and, say, sharing the um, assessment process among other assessments in order to build a more comprehensive and reliable judgment of the student's performance. Clearly, the dedicated educational roles were of huge support across those sites that had them. And finally, I suppose we decided in terms of just looking at, say, training educators, we had, I suppose, a, a complex then around, should we train less educators more stringently or should we engage with all of them but risk that lack of consistency across, say, educators and across assessors? So there are points to consider, I guess, um, and just a really, a, a little just taste of what came out of that PhD research. Thanks everyone. And many thanks, Anne, and you did it within time. Just about, Thank you very, very I was, much, just about. I was that red thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 that was the more subtle approach from Jura today, so don't worry. <laughs> can I just say to everybody that if you have questions from Anne, can you please put them in the chat and Anne will answer the questions directly through the chat for you. Um, I'm now going to hand over to our second speaker, uh, to Siobhan Magner from the Mayo Sligo Leitrim Education and Training Board. And uh, Siobhan is going to speak with us about ideas for work-based assessment consistency in the FET sector in the FTE section. Thanks very much, Siobhan. And remember, Siobhan. I know, I'm looking forward to you. I'm looking forward to Terry. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. And um, thanks, Terry and Gerald, for having me on here. My name is Siobhan Magner. I'm the National Program Manager for the Sales Apprenticeship. And I'm very privileged to be working uh, in the area of apprenticeship in the FET sector. Um, and to see also how my colleagues across the country in the 16 ETBs actually manage consistency in the whole area of work-based assessment. Um, for those of you that wouldn't have a, a knowledge of apprenticeships, um, uh, back in the day a few years ago, the Apprenticeship Council um, specified criteria that we needed to incorporate into our apprenticeship programs when developing them. And those included, first of all, 50% minimum of on the job work experience or on the job learning. And the other was we had to have the capacity to deliver the program nationally. So I'll use the sales apprenticeship as a case study here. Um, we're currently the coordinating provider of the sales apprenticeship. We don't have collaboration providers. We don't have other ETBs engaged in the apprenticeship itself. Um, our current cohort, we commenced the program in September and our current cohort, we have 12 companies across eight counties and um, small, oh, these are all small, medium sized enterprises. We have a diverse cohort of learners um, Geraldine mentioned earlier on, we, you know, there's different cohorts, different abilities. We have leaving cert students, we have people in sales for years. Um, um, we've returners, etc. So trying to keep consistency in assessment, you know, is very challenging. 84% of our program is delivered on the job. So workplace mentors are extremely um, important to the whole sales apprenticeship. When talking about um, uh, consistencies, we are consistency. I used an Australian model that, from the Department of Education, Training and Youth Affairs and, uh, in Australia. And they um, came up with these five Ps that were important to ensure consistency. And what we do in apprenticeships across the ETBs is we would focus on, we, we could actually align what we do in with these five Ps, people, process, products, perspective, and policy. So the, the people are all of the, those involved with the assessment process themselves. Um, the process involved is how these assessments are planned, conducted, and reviewed. The products are all of those um, documentations, et cetera, items that are used in planning, conducting, and reviewing. The perspective is taking into consideration the requirements of industry employers and then the policy areas are all about how the assessment process would be managed and implemented. So to see, to look at what we're doing in um, MSLETB with the sales apprenticeship, first of all the people involved, there's ourselves the program, uh, the program team, so I'm the manager of the program team, we also have lead tutor, we have our tutors, we have the TEL team, including our e-mentor, because we deliver some of our program online, and we've literacy and numeracy specialists. We have workplace mentors. Every apprentice that um, 
that comes on board to the program is nominated or they have a, a signed a workplace mentor from the company to them and they're there to act as the guide and the support over the two years. And there's a very strong relationship. There's a tripartite relationship between ourselves and MSLETB, the company themselves and the workplace mentors and the student or the learner. And you know, there's quite a lot of support offered there to both the mentors and the students. Um, we have external authenticators involved. And um, my colleague, Jenny Conroy has, they've just completed um, a very big project actually down in ETBI in conjunction with our colleagues in the Further Education Support Unit, where they've established a national um, external authenticator panel. So they've over 750 external authenticators trained at the moment. Um, so they're trained nationally. And then they're, if you want, if an ETB is looking for an EA, they go to this panel to um, find somebody that would be suitably uh, qualified for their particular field of learning. So there's 750 of those at the moment um, that have gone through the exact same process of training. And then ourselves in MSL ETB, we would meet them to brief them in the whole area in terms of learning outcomes, et cetera. We have collaborating providers. A lot of the, the ETBs would have collaborating providers in their apprenticeship. We have a national examination board and the national examination board considers the delivery and assessment of apprenticeship programs. And we also then have our employers, the CSG, the consortium steering group. So these are the people involved in um, the, the assessment process. So all of our assessments are generated and designed in a national, you know, nationally. So once we come on, once we have collaboration providers, other ETBs on board, all of everybody will, will play a part in designing these assessments and developing these rubrics, et cetera. The second is the process. And the process, this involves, around the, you know, how assignments are planned, conducted and reviewed as such. So there's a formal process of designing assessments we have, as I mentioned there, the National Examination Board. Um, we, in terms of teaching and learning strategies as well, all of our tutors um, have to complete a 20 hour CPD program in TEL and blended learning. And also they all have to complete digital skills for the online classroom. Um, and part and parcel of that is developing and designing assessments, giving feedback, et cetera. Um, and we also, if I was part of that training, um, we, we look at tools, particularly for formative assessment as well, tell tools for formative assessment. We also have sectoral quality assurance procedures, and these were designed by ETBI, um, and they were adopted by the different ETBs taking on apprenticeship programs. So in those quality insurance, oh my goodness, quality assurance procedures, um, these outline the roles, responsibilities um, of everybody involved in it. Okay, in terms of the products, we have things like the validation documentation, the professional award type descriptors. Um, we have experience exchange workshops with all of the tutors, national tutors. Um, we design, there's a specification for assessment and rubrics that we have to adhere to. Um, and then all of our skills-based assessment are all recorded. The perspective addressing industry, we've got to ensure that employers' needs are met. Um, we and we go to the policy then the lastly again we're looking at the policy how the assessment is managed and implement we adhere to qqi guidelines our sectoral qaps and the etbi after a year have a and do i not get one of your minutes no <laughs> <laughs> no i'm have, afraid not um, siobhan <laughs> after a year of the apprenticeship running we have a monitoring enhancement panel that come around and what they do is they observe and give advice to see if we can improve etc. So we do our level best at consistency uh, across the FET sector. Um, and we'll be talking about challenges later on, but the challenges I suppose that we would see um, would be things like uh, the grading of assessments. Um, we would also have challenges. Uh, I'm going to have to replace a second time. I think you want it done a second time. Okay, I give up challenges and resources. Okay, good luck. <laughs> I think actually, Colin, if you can put up the slide, that would be quite good. I'm just conscious, Siobhan, sorry, that it's quite close to the end. That's of all right. The, um, no problem. At the end of the webinar. So these are the three planet challenges. And thank you. Thank you a million, Siobhan. I'm going to hand back to, to Joe now. 
Okay, uh, thanks, Ravon. And I know it's very tough to actually try and get it all in, but um, but thank you for that. It gets a really nice flavor. And actually, the five Ps was bent down very well with, with people. So you might have questions for Siobhan. So so stick stick them up for Siobhan, Siobhan there. Thank you, both speakers. Just moving on for the last last few minutes. This is coming up a lot um, and the grading approaches. And, and Siobhan had it there in her last slide, actually, that the grading approaches. This challenge has been there for as long as I've been working in, in this area. Um, how do you, what is the grading scale? Um, do you do um, a pass fail? Many of you who are in that C context, that top right hand quadrant, will find it very hard sometimes in the shifting sands of the complexity of different placements. And Anne alluded to it as well when she talked about the geography and the different contexts that the students are avoiding and because they feel they're not going to get consistent grades. Do you go with pass fail? And uh, do you go with pass fail distinction? Uh, and somebody mentioned it's very hard. What does it even what does this distinction mean? Somebody mentioned that in the chat. Do you call it then students often say pass sounds like 40%? So you do, do you use the language competent, not yet competent? That was a very nice one I, I, we've used in the past. And I think that's, you know, so you're, you, you're alluding to the idea this is a developmental process. Or do you use graded percentages, grades, A, B, C, D, and percentages? Um, some of the challenges around this, again, alluded to by some by our speakers are um, on placement. This was something that came through with, with research I had done um, in, in UCD. Um, some practitioners say, well, I don't just don't give firsts. I don't give A's, I just never do. I just, so, they, in, in, so they've decided that they don't do A's. So, I mean, already students are at a disadvantage. Um, but then if you go pass fail, um, some students don't like it. They feel it's unfair. Um, you know, this distinction is very unfair for students. Um, students feel deflated when they get a pass after 30 years of work sorry, 30 weeks of work, um, you know, and again, that came through in, in internship research that we did. So, um, so there's not an easy answer to this, um, but it has a big impact and it really needs to be part of your debate when you're looking at this in, in, in different contexts. Um, it's certainly um, in an Irish kind of context, um, common internationally as well. We work off a norm referenced um, thinking um, where we feel is certainly in the institutional kind of context that we should have a spread of marks. Um, and certainly uh, when it comes to then practitioners grading, uh, they don't necessarily think in that way. So there's, there's an underlying challenge in the, in the grading and the value system around grades. Um, so I think that this, this really needs to be interrogated in your work-based assessment because it has a big impact on, um, your, on, on, on the consistency. The other big challenge in consistency is, and some of you mentioned it in the chats I see coming through, um, is the standards and competencies. Um, and language here is quite complicated. We've only a few minutes to go through it, but it's really core to um, what we're measuring against. What is it that you're trying to actually measure? Um, and the standards um, are often, this was the difference between the two, the standards are what students should know and be able to do in relation to established criteria, often set by policymakers, professional bodies, and competencies are more how students apply their learning to new contexts in multiple situations. And there might be sort of competencies, and these are where your assessment tools come in, um, and these are more unique to the individual assessor. One of the challenges in this are, are they measuring, it links with validity, are they measuring what you really want to measure? Another thing in this, and it comes from the general literature around assessment, is around well-designed measures. And some of you mentioned tools and the tools coming through. And how, how good are your standards uh, and how specific are they? And one thing to think about here is, are they more holistic? They talk about holistic standards which give a broad, wide picture. I think Anne might have mentioned to me earlier in our chat that, you know, the number of statements that you might use on a form, you know, what's the optimal specificity of, of the form? Because the more holistic, the stronger it is on validity, but more challenging with reliability, consistency. Whereas if you have a lot of detail, you are more likely to get consistency, but is it valid? 
this we could talk about for hours, but there is something here about the nature and the specificity of the statements and how they're measured. So we did think in the last few minutes, which is why we cut you off, Siobhan, because we wanted to make sure we got this. So sorry about cutting you off. We just thought in the last few minutes, if you would, in the chat, this is an activity Terry introduced me to, the idea of hold and share. It's an interesting one to try. We want you to write in the chat, uh, but don't press return yet. We want you to write in the chat very simply. Well, there's a not quite a simple thing, but to think about it. How do you use standards to support consistency? And if we take the standards are like your statements of expected knowledge and skills, how do you use them to support consistency? Have a little think, type in the chat, but don't, don't click return yet, because we will call it at the end, we'll all click it together, we'll share it together. So just have a little think, how do you use, and Siobhan and Anna, it'd be good to get even your thoughts on this as well. How do you use standards to support the consistency? So just to give you a, a minute to do that. And then I'll get you to share all together in a minute. How do you use standards? Pause for a second, a bit of quiet. Give Alison a rest from her hands. <laughs> Okay, if you all click share now, so I'll click return and we'll see what comes up. There we go, great stuff. Make sure everyone's aware, refer to an, the national framework with difficulty. Our professional standards are designed for educational purposes, best practice examples, ensure a fair and equitable marks. Great, thanks for that, Colette. A guide, a framework, Karina. Yeah, thank you. Standard user scaffolds around grading, communication, robust rubrics, yeah. Great. Educators want clearer statements and want students to be able to do it in order to achieve outcomes, but can be challenging across varied areas of speciality. Yeah, thanks for that again, Anne. Um, and, and do you allow students, and this gets more into validity, but do you allow students to create their own outcomes, learning contracts, developing their own kind of unique measures? So I think, so thank you for those. Um, thank you for those. I'm just gonna do a little concluding thought here. And I suppose it's trying to put reliability in contexts. Um, came across a really, interesting author, Rola Ajwa, I think that's how she pronounced it. She's going to be a speaker in our, in our um, conference coming up in our symposium. And I thought this might be a nice um, statement to kind of nearly finish on, but like all assessment design requires compromise between contextualization and standardization. So this balance between the context that we've been talking about, whether it's geography or types of placements, the educational impact and validity of the assessment might not be worth sacrificing in the pursuit of reliability. I suppose this is throwing a spanner in the works here a little bit, but it is about thinking about reliability and consistency is really, really important, but carefully considered because it does, it's really interesting to think about um, in this work-based learning, how, how, important reliability is versus validity. And I think it's an important kind of thought to, con to conclude with. And I, this slide just pulls together maybe some of the thoughts that have been talked about today. We have standards in the middle, really, really important. And I know QQI in particular and, and in involved in national bodies and professional accreditation bodies, really, really important that our standards are right. Our grading schemes are, are reflecting these, really need to think about your grading schemes and go back to that, what is the right types of grading. And then all these things that may help, um, there are two speakers talk to, um, you know, well-designed rubrics, moderation policies, the five Ps approach that Siobhan was talking about, really nice kind of way of tidying all that up together. Um, and um, research around grading and interesting students talking about belief in the system. I thought that was an interesting point as well, that, that it doesn't feel credible if it's not reliable. So I think this kind of summarizes it. Um, 
and, I, and so hopefully you have enjoyed the talk. I will hand over now maybe to Terry to just say what the next steps are in the last few minutes here. Uh, so Terry, I might hand over back to you. Um, and thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Ger. So, so first of all, can I thank Ger? Can I thank Anne? I thank Siobhan for the contributions. I think it's been a very interesting uh, discussion. I'd also like to thank, thank the, the QQI, our partners in this particular series. Um, just to let you know what's happening uh, for the next phase, we will, of course, as I said, get the recording of the webinar and a summary of the chat and the slides and make them available to you. Um, our next webinar, Colin, if you can go on to the next page, our symposium is on the 19th of November. We've already confirmed two of our speakers, uh, Dr. Nora McRae, um, who will speak about the global work integrated learning framework and understanding the context of assessment discussions, and Arola Adwa, who, who, who's just, who Ger has just quoted, will talk about the challenges of authentic and aligned assessment in complex work contexts, the way follow, forward for policy and practice. We'll also have speakers that will talk around professional competence. We're putting the program together, Dick and I and ourselves are putting the program together and we'll uh, send you the information on it as soon as we have it uh, available. Everything that's happened in the first webinar and this webinar will of course feed into the final symposium. Um, once again, thank you to everybody. Now, if any of you have got five minutes to spare, one of the, uh, if I could ask any of you that could to wait for five minutes one of the things that we aimed to do across the series was to set up a community of practice. And um, the community hasn't been that active, so we just need some help from you about how we can make it better. So I would like to um, hand over to my colleague, Katrina Hay, who has, who's going to have some um, uh, questions for you. The session will take maybe five to seven minutes. We just need a few in, in, inputs from you about how we can try and make this community work. Uh, Katrina, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Terry, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for those who can stay on just for a few minutes. Um, and thank you again to the uh, great uh, seminar or, or conference we had today. But one of the things we want to do is to try and um, uh, promote the teaching and learning community within the National Forum and many of you are probably already members of this work based assessment learning community. And what I'd like to do is to try and get some feedback from you today is how how we can make this a better community, how we can get more interaction in it. So I basically have three questions I want to ask you here. The first is, I'd like you to put these into the chat also so that we can capture it. But the first is, what value do you see in being a member of this kind of community? And you might reflect on other communities that you are uh, with, you know, involved in and the ones that bring most value to you and what, you know, what types of values are they? And um, why would you want to be a member of this community? What would you hope to get from um, this community? So if you just take a minute, I can see a few people putting in chat there. That's great um, to hear other people's views, to extend practice, to information share. And that, that is definitely one of the values of, of uh, a community of practice. Uh, learning across the sectors, that's an interesting one because there's a diverse group here. You have many different clinicians, internships, apprenticeships, and so on, uh, different types of practices. Um, standardization so a lot of the things probably that you were discussing with Jer and them earlier are coming up here so that's great so maybe Colin if we just move on to the next question the next question I want to ask you is um what you know we want to make this community serve you better as Terry alluded to there hasn't been a whole lot of traction in it so in order to make it serve it better what can you what do you think you can do to make it serve you better you can just click on there um, Colin, so from your perspective, and then from the National Forum's, pr Forum's perspective, what do you think will make us do this community of practice better? So I want you to think of it in terms of what input you can make, and also what the National Forum can do with the, with the two.
so there's one and request for volunteers so you've jumped the gun there and request to volunteers that's that's something that i'm i i we'd like to do choose a theme to explore what quality means work together to create a national toolkit so that's these are great ideas um and we certainly take those on board. And my final question that I want to ask you then, if you want to move on, Colin, is, is in terms of joining up, uh, a lot of you here are in the network, some of you may not be, but in terms of joining up and contributing, this has come up here. We need some sort of leadership, some sort of people to volunteer, to manage and maintain a community of practice. So these things don't operate in isolation. They need somebody to have an input. So somebody who has a particular area and, and just to pick physiotherapy practice, somebody might like to moderate uh, a discussion on that. So what we're looking for here is volunteers from this group who'd like to be more involved in this community and practice and to, to have a role in maintaining it. So you can either volunteer here and I see a few people doing it already, that's great. Or you can see my email address there in the forum or you can contact anyone in the forum and let us know. And we'll get back to you shortly after this webinar uh, with a plan of going forward. And that's great. I see loads of people volunteer there and, and thank you very much, that's, that's super. Well, Everybody, I really appreciate the few minutes that you've taken there. Um, we'll take away all of your um, your ideas and your insights, and um, most especially the names of those that have already volunteered to see if between now and the symposium in November, uh, we can actually start to get that community working. Uh, once again, thank you very much to um, our partners, to QI, to our speakers, and to our interpreter, Alison, who's been working so hard uh, for the last hour or so. Um, I look forward to seeing you all at the symposium um, and where our, our discussions will continue. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.